Podcast. Welcome to today's episode of the podcast where we discuss the latest installments of a different series every show. On July 15th, Disney released season two of Hit Monkey on Hulu and Disney+. Plus. The show follows a Japanese macaque turned assassin guided by the ghost of a former hitman named Bryce. It's based on a comic created by Daniel Wei and Dalibor Telegique. The show consists of 10 20-minute episodes with a zinger of a cliffhanger. And to kick it off, I want to test your knowledge about Hit Monkey. The comic book killer was based on what? A, James Bond as a parody, B, Hitman's Agent 47 as a parody, C, Bryce and Hitmonkey were a response to DC's popular characters, Mansoor, Mala, and The Brain, or D, in 2009, the creators Daniel Wei and Dalibor Talajik um, wanted to make an animal anti-hero that could be adapted into live action as easily as possible. So they chose a monkey because they assumed that would be the easiest to work with. Well, I the only thing I know about him monkey is that I've seen the first season of it. So I'm just going to go with D. D? Yeah. So you think that they just wanted to make a live ad- adaptation and so they chose yeah. that. Nope, it was actually Agent 47 Hitman's oh, wow. like the, okay. yeah, the video yeah. game and I think they also made it into several movies, right? Yep. Uh, a parody of that, which I found very interesting. So you've watched the last 10 episodes. I, we both watched two seasons worth at this point. What did you think of season one? What did I think of season one? I thought it was a pretty good show. Like, I definitely was excited when I heard it had been picked up. And I was more impressed because I remember when we first started talking about it, I think it was during the Modoc podcast, yeah, right? right? And it just sounded like a terrible idea. You have a, a monkey cartoon. It reminded me of like Elvis and that series where he just has a sidekick of a monkey Agent the Elvis? entire time. Yeah, well, and I said when we did the Agent Elvis podcast how that monkey did just feel like a ripoff of Hit Monkey because season one had come out by that time. Yeah, but there was a lot more like heart and soul infused in the show, a lot more action that actually paid off. A lot of the times you have gratuitous violence and that's what the premise of the show was sort of geared toward but at the same time i felt like they were they were able to pull off a pretty decent story season two they just expanded it and they also like with the cliffhanger at least flipped it up on us because if you haven't seen the show go watch it but um in season two the ending bryce becomes the human again he gets his life back right just like he was in episode one in exchange for hit monkey dying right and so now he's the ghost and so it's like a supernatural thing in season six where Sam comes back and starts haunting Dean or whatever. Well, I was wondering what was going to happen because a couple days before Hit Monkey was released, I was on IMDb and I saw that it said 2021, which is when the first season came out, to 2024. And I was wondering if the second season was going to be the end to it all. And when I was watching the final episode, I was like, okay, we're probably not going to get Bryce or Jason Sudeikis if they are going to make a season three or like it just seemed like his character was going to be be gone because i thought that the show was going to be or was canceled in some way even though it's called hit monkey you don't have a show without ted lasso you don't have a show <laughs> without jason today he adds so much to the role so i would give season one like a seven out of ten but i think season two was even better than season one i thought that the animation was colorful and at times beautiful they spared like no expense there was times where it seemed like it was straight out of the comic book it was oddly even like avatar the last airbender when they went into that weird samurai animation you also got the bloody kills which i liked seeing as well and i thought that the character designs not only for the devil but for foresight who shows up in episode four he was the villain was really cool i was sad that we only got him for one episode because i thought that just the way that the characters were designed uh it was just a lot better how about we get into the plot of it a little bit so this season begins with bryce coming back it seemed like he had ascended at the end of last year but he actually descended is yeah we do learn that pretty early on he has to make a deal with the devil to to come back and hang out with Hit Monkey under the guise that he would make Hit Monkey kill people for the devil, bad people. Feed him souls. Feed him souls. And at the same time, Hit Monkey is dealing with the fact that Akiko, his best friend or the person he was kind of in love with, um, I, I don't know if that it was a relationship weird, was yeah, like. Yeah, I always got that they were just friends, but yeah. Yeah, well, he had to he had to kill her uncle, right? Because mm-hmm. um, that guy was corrupt and he was going to take over Japan and do evil things. At the end of season The one. guy tried to kill the lady cop who was there. Haruka, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, that was also Akiko's friend. But Akiko didn't take it that way. She saw that Hitmonkey had assassinated her uncle and she swore revenge. She even took up the mantle of Lady Assassin. What's her name? Lady uh, Bullseye, right? Yeah. And uh, and we kind of just 
by the end of season one, get that cliffhanger that she may be training. But by season two, she learns rather quickly how to become a full out lady assassin and start killing people yep. as effectively as Hit Monkey and go toe to toe with him. Um, they keep on throughout the season having little rematches here or there. They hinted at it for the first four episodes. I think that the first time they actually have a rematch is in episode five, which is actually named Akiko. That was the name of the episode. And I think that's the first time we see them fighting. And it also provides you for the people who there was a lot of backlash to last season's finale where Akiko just doesn't understand like we had seen her work up this relationship with Hip Monkey, where you'd think, well, a logical conversation would lead them to kind of mend things over. But instead, she is just hell bent on killing this. And thing. it would it would be one thing if well, the person who pulled the gun it wasn't in uh, like plain sight, and Akiko just never understood that he was about to kill someone. But the but the, but the villain had literally just said, "I am a corrupt guy. I am going to do all this bad shit." Or I was I was planning to. I, and and then that's when he died. And so in a way, you understand understand that Akiko felt bad because he had come clean to her but at the same time it's not like she thought he was a, right. a complete innocent soul and yeah. and he pulls the gun out in front of her mm-hmm. like it was clear he was going to kill so someone. that upset a lot of people episode four kind of provides more of a backstory because we see that she was bullied her parents had died the uncle was literally the only one there for her she was kind of like forced into a situation where he was her only trust i think that was benefactor. episode five sorry I thought it was the Akiko episode. Yeah, episode Here's, five. Oh, that's what I meant then. Yes. Um. So so when we learn that, it kind of at least shows why she's not accepting of all these other details, even though Hitmonkey has made a point of whenever she's about to kill him, or he's a, he has the ability to kill her, he always throws the gun away yep. or, or, or spares her life, even saving it at one point and bringing it to the cooperative. There are a lot of arcs going on in this second season and in a way it feels very cluttered and i can understand if anybody's watching this and is just trying to like keep track of one they may dislike the fact that it's so scattered out there um one of which is bryce's redemption arc because she he's trying to get close to his daughter at the same time that he's back on the planet um that that i thought was kind of a con because i understood why they had it in the series but it took up a lot of time and you knew where it was going from the first second yeah well a lot of these are by themselves very cliche and predictable but together they kind of create this happy mess i think akiko's unresolved revenge she pops up here and there throughout the season but i said it myself at the end it kind of felt like it underdeveloped it like that was the thing they really really wanted to be the overall and instead they got kind of sidetracked with the alderman and the co-op it started out that way because yeah i think that the first time we see her from season two is at the end of episode three when she's putting on the lady bullseye ma- mask and it seemed like we were really going to get a lot of fights with her and yeah she kind of disappears throughout the back half of the second and you season also have lady bullseye herself the one who died at the end of last season return to try to have her own revenge story yeah which goes very it's a very short-lived revenge, and I did like the way they killed her off. I was going to say spirit. that. Yes, yeah. But at the same time, it felt like another thing that was thrown in there. At first, I thought she was going to be the equivalent of like the second hormone monster. <laughs> when I forgot, was it the second season when yeah. uh, when they introduced another one? Um, deal with the devil. That subplot originally, it seemed the devil straight out said, "I will give you Bryce a human form, uh, not just allow you back as a ghost." But you, once that human form is up, those 48 hours are up, then you will come back with me. And by the end of the series, he said, no, this was the plan all along, was that you were going to just become human now. And it's like, that didn't add up that, exactly. It also, they just, they didn't really make it clear. I only understood what the deal truly was at the very end there, because I thought it was 48 hours, no matter if he turns into a ghost or not, because he was given the option by the devil, and it was just going to be up. But no, it's apparently 48 hours if he's just a full-on human. I, I was in the same camp. I watched the full season up until the end, being like, he only, they accomplished all this stuff funerals deaths uh team ups um loves found and lost all in 48 hours that seems completely unacceptable in the timeline only to then realize at the end that whenever he phases out goes into ghost form he's not using up his time in which case the first day he gets it he spends 12 hours on a bender and then falls asleep and he just wastes all that time when he could have just turned himself 
phased out and, and it just seems like such a ludicrous move it, it but for me it answered a question and yeah i gave like 10 extra questions that i had because <laughs> he was in human form if that was the deal and he understood it for way too long for way too much of this season right? every second that his daughter wasn't in front of him he should have been phasing out even in front of her sometimes he should have just been like i have to do this if he had yeah. just been straight up about the deal i think people would have understood that also when he fights he usually stays in his human form he'll go in and out if something attacks him but like I don't understand why he wouldn't stay in his ghost form and just use the telep- telepathy that he has or, or whatever. Right, because we can, see that a couple times. He can still fight when he's in the ghost form. So it does raise some questions that way. But because Bryce is such a prick to himself, <laughs> to everybody else, it also makes sense that he's a little stupid and maybe doesn't really uh, think along those lines. He was going to save his last two minutes for like big moments, weddings and stuff like that, which was which I thought was a very cool plan yeah. but then he ended up having to use them to save uh his daughter right and take the bullets for her which also was kind of yeah because he's also immortal so people yeah. shoot him he's able to stay alive so then yeah I- iris kind of has this realization about her dad she also falls in love she also has a realization that she is sort of like her dad she also gets a new job being the cleaner they join an agency and we're not even touching upon the main story arc which the main story arc is that hit monkey right Yep. joins this cooperative of assassins because he thinks that the main villain of the series are these people that are stealing swords, all powerful swords called the Aldermen. And these guys are not good guys. They have been uh, around for a long time and they basically just like hold these stores and use it for power. I'm sorry. I need to jump in here because it was episode three when they showed it. I know I already complimented the animation, but the way that that was shot, the way that they uh, kind of explained how the Aldermans came to be with the yeah. relics that they were getting, the black and white. I mean, it was like, it was just awe-inspiring. I think this is this has to be, just in terms of style, I think one of the best animated shows of the year, personally. I don't think you watch enough anime to like give that a true reading i feel like it's a very good show but it's like a less engaging version of chainsaw man you know if you compare that it's it or or scavenger's rain it can turn into scavenger rain especially at the end there when they had that whole plant thing going on and on earth and everything was being absorbed by a, a different flower you know kind of poison ivy that was taken straight out of the legend of Korra. <laughs> that yeah. was something that happened i think in season three or season four of but it you think of like attack on titan you think of all those other animated shows that you don't watch and i don't know if it's fair to say that this is like spec all, like, all of those are anime and i'm also just talking about just this yeah, year if you're talking about an english speak oh, okay and just this year it, it, it devil was the blue devil cry thing that's up for so many emmys right now i think that also has an amazing uh, animated thing it's these studios are put under such a pressure that it is incredible what they're able to turn out and sometimes even the simple scenes are really cool i think it's just for me the hit monkey it reminds me a lot of when it's just kind of normal archer where it's like the yes. char- the backgrounds and the characters the way that they move and whenever they were able to be as colorful as they were or i thought as uh intelligent or um compelling as they were i thought the animation really worked well for the it. humor is also very archer so yes. like bryce could definitely fit in with the i think they used to be called isis team um but uh also the director of the series this season all the same guy he is the i think he worked as one of the art consultants or something on archer oh that makes a like lot more many yeah. many many seasons so you have but the people in this new group are dot boone okay so you're talking about the co-op yes slick or slike i I forgot like yeah and then double tap and then amara who amara reminded me a lot of the x-men uh emma frost who could turn into like the diamond character at any moment because technically the same universe all marvel you know how marvel studios like kind of ate uh itself and became like it took off modok and all those other shows yes so this still technically is a marvel show it's just probably like there's a very very tiny chance it ever pulls part of the what is what is the upcoming marvel project series it's about the the multiverse but um you've got deadpool and wolverine coming out uh it, literally in like a week captain america brave new world right thunderbolts uh the fantastic four blade avengers the king dynasty those are all like phase five and yeah. then secret wars and secret wars is where i think hit monkey has been in the comics part of before but nobody's really expecting that to happen this is kind of just like an offshoot where they've been allowed to persist 
um, and where Netflix wasn't allowed to persist with with their series yeah, or anything. Right, of so, course. So I'm very fortunate, and I think the cast and, and crew and everybody was surprised to get a <laughs> second season. And so now that they're betting on a third season, it'll be really interesting. Okay, so season two is not the complete end. Because like we said... Well, of course not, no. So we have the full group. They're trying to get this golden teddy bear. It's yeah, the well, relic. Do you want to talk about the cooperative a little bit? Because again, the aldermen were introduced to such an evil group that it felt like at the beginning of the season, they were going to be really hard to beat. But the way that they just rushed through that yeah, storyline. Yeah, no, again, I, I think when I came to the story, there were some parts that really worked and some parts that didn't. And yeah, it's suddenly out of nowhere. I think it's like episode six or seven. Uh, Hitmonkey feels like he has a real strong connection with Boone, who is the okay. leader of the group. But I'm asking you to define the cooperative because they are just such a weird entity to me. Like you've got the you've said the characters, but what are they actually doing there? What is their purpose? Well, like, not their secret purpose, but like the, how they pitched it to the monkey at first, because they come in and like they're trying to three, they're right? trying to stop the aldermans because the aldermans, what they've done is they've taken, I think, eight relics. Right. Mm-hmm. And then they've melted it down and then kind of kept it for themselves. I and, don't know if they've melted them down. I thought that they were all kept separate and that like the that they were just keeping them for themselves and using them for power. Right. So what the what the uh, cooperative is trying to do to is they're trying to yeah take them back so that they won't have that power anymore. Exactly. But it's all made up of hurt people people with ptsd in the past people who are superheroes but who feel as if like the government has betrayed them they're they're kind of like their own missionary or um what's the word uh military right. force right and, and so again you have dot which is like the innocent anime voiced because she i think is one of the voices from chainsaw man but also does a lot of dubbing oh, that's cool she reminded you her character look was a lot like uh the Spider-Man. ring I oh, thought the ring, absolutely, but not. she, but she's the most innocent, like you said, out of all of them. So not like that character. She was the one reason why I thought this group was legit. Like seeing her and the way that she portrayed, I was like, "There's no way they're going to make that character evil." And mm-hmm. then I was saw the. It became obvious that the rest of the group was, and I still didn't believe it was her. And so I was happy when they showed that she was unaware of everything that was going on. Right, Boone is supposed to be kind of I don't know. He's like Chris Hemsworth from Bad Times at the El Royale, where it's like he's the he's supposed to be the charismatic kind of cult leader that brings assassins into the group. I don't know how much Disenchantment you watched. Um, not not much. But the main character's friend, Elfo, the one with the really tiny elf with the weird yeah. voice, that's who voiced Boone. So it's kind of funny. Oh, nice. Yeah, okay. and Disenchantment also has like a heavy, like a lot of these shows that we're reviewing now, the animated shows, have a heavy reliance on um, like heaven and hell and gods, Crapopolis, has been hotel exploding cans we just said exploding last time exploding kittens smiling friends it's always deals with the devil or like someone falling and and having to redeem themselves in Keith, some way Keith, so Keith David and Jason Sudeikis I thought were standouts in their role Keith David always is what a great choice to pick for the devil but like you said Jason Sudeikis I think he's the one that really sells this show so I thought that the voice acting there really excelled too. Uh-huh. I, I mean, I'll go through the other. So Double Tap, right, was yes. one of the other co-op he's, he's members. He's kind of a gun guy. <laughs> he's That's all he is. Yeah, obsessed. With, he's probably the one who's the most antagonistic towards Hit Monkey too throughout the entire thing. He doesn't want him to join the team, even right. when the devil is saying, "Hey, you guys should join up with Hit Monkey," right? And so he's voiced by Tramel Tr- Tillman, who is the African American guy Seth from Severance. Oh, wow. Yeah. Would so never have guessed that. So he's yeah. <laughs> playing an amazing role in that. And so I can't wait to when that comes back. Um, and then uh, Slyke, I couldn't find the person who voiced him. I looked all around. Um, and then Amara is Stephanie Beatriz um, from Brooklyn Nine-Nine. Has been Hotel. She plays Baggy. She was also in that Lin-Manuel Miranda thing. Well, that explains is... the Keith David connection as well. Yeah. In fact, I have another game for you if you want to. Here okay. So the way that this one works, it's kind of like a family feud, right? So you got a lot of famous people in the cast. I'll go through them real quick. There's Fred Tata Skior, who's done a ton of voices. He's Hit Monkey. Jason Sudeikis. Ali Mackey, who is also from the Big Door Prize. She plays the bartender in that, one of the main characters. Olivia Munn, uh, Akiko. Uh, Leslie Jones joined this season. Eunice. As Eunice. She yep. was the agent. Kristen Milotti, um, She Again, How I Met Your Mother, obviously. and She plays Iris. Lady Bullseye was Reku Islesworth. The reason I'm going through all these names is there's a purpose for it. Uh, Rob Cordry played Buddy. 
Um, I saw was, his name in the credits, but I didn't know who he actually played. I mean, yeah. Lowe's Dot, Stephanie Beatriz, like I said, was Amara. And then I, Nat, Nat Faxon, who um, was Boone, is the one from Disenchantment. Um, and and so all of them together have been in a lot of other animated shows. Right. And so I was wondering if oh, what overlap you could pick. If you had to pick one, like if you get any of these just without any hints, then I'll, I'll, I'll give you the win. But like what show... What animated program do you think that more than three of the cast had been a part of? Okay, go ahead. Oh, oh, oh! Any? Yeah. Well, I mean, I think you should. We already if you said get the two. Most that'd be insane. We said two. I mean, it was Wait, Hasbin Hotel. Well, that's two. Yeah. Okay. Oh, I, the only two. All right. Um, let me let me think. Uh, maybe Fiona and Cake, like Adventure Time. No, it's not really ones that we've done as much. These are like old standing shows. Think like the most. In and I will tell you, it's not the same. Oh, I was gonna say. Okay, Family Guy. Family Guy is one of them. It's not the top one, but it's six of them have been on Family Guy's voices. I was gonna guess Alf Park, but I don't really think that works. What about regular show? Uh, no. No. I'll give you another one that's much lower down there. Three of them were in DuckTales. DuckTales, okay. Yes. Uh, any any show? I mean, Think are of these... like like shows that even big celebrity like drama, it's like fun. Game of Thrones, people would just randomly show up on this animated show because they would be making fun of it. SpongeBob? Almost. No, <laughs> I don't think. What what episode are you trying to think of where they made fun of Game of Thrones? I mean, they can I'll make just man. give it to you. Uh, whoa, whoa, wait, what about My Little Pony? I know that that has a lot. Wow, like... your guesses are getting worse. I, it's Robot Chicken. So Robot Chicken. Oh, well, of course. Seven of them have appeared in that. Um, three have also appeared in Duck, in, sorry, uh, BoJack Horseman. Oh, okay. I'll continue yeah. it with one more question. Which are the legitimate criticisms, and by legitimate, I mean like actually voice that I was able to find, repeated on like numerous articles about the show? Um, it, it, you can tell me whether or not these are true or false, Okay. okay. Um, there was a little bit of backlash last year or to the first season about how d j Japanese culture, especially with like things like Shogun coming out and how much dedication there was to trying to be accurate to that. Right. Um, how it was kind of stereotypically represented. Uh, yeah, it. yeah, true. That's true. A Kiko story arc. We already sort of discussed huh. this, particularly the end of season one that had a backlash as well. It has to be true. Yeah, that's <laughs> true. How quickly people became amazing assassins. So, and not just people, I should say monkeys as well. I mean, yeah, because Hit Monkey was like within the first three episodes that he kind of already has his training done. He's already killing people. Um, true. Yep, it's true. Okay. And the gratuitous violence. I mean, it's a TVMA show. I feel like that one would be false. Is that true also? Though? No, it was also true. They were all true. They were all true. Yes. Um, so, so yeah. It, I mean, when it comes to gratuitous violence, especially in animations with a show called Hit Monkey, I don't think you can really blame it for that. Okay. So if you, I've been playing devil's advocate, but if you're like watching this show and you're seeing a lot of death scenes and you're not getting into it because you're like, what's the point of watching a monkey kill a lot of people? And you don't want to buy into like it's soulful, um, like seeing its backstory play out and, and kind of just falling in love with the amount of action. Like they're not afraid. They're shameless when it comes to confronting problems in this show yeah they have a bad guy the next episode they're fighting that bad guy even if it's like with a kiko i i really thought that they were going to save those up at certain points but she just kept on coming in randomly to fight and, and i don't think we got enough of her doing anything else but that but it still was cool to see in episode three episode seven um those kind of character changes happen because... episode seven i think was the saddest that it got because that's when we got haruka's death right it's so surprising because she had she had so much left to do. And right? I was I was so scared that they were going to bring her back. And they still might. But I, I yeah. was glad that in this season they didn't decide. It's like once she gets her Viking funeral at the beginning of episode eight, she was gone. I, I was like that it wasn't an accident. Like, right. It would have been one thing if uh, Akiko had done the classic. Uh, I'm not trying to actually kill my friend here. I'm just trying to get this hit monkey. And then she gets even angrier because she she blames hit monkey for the death. No, she killed her on purpose. <laughs> She's gone through like a full Harley Quinn. And we talked about it. But the way that the ghosts kind of have to follow uh, the characters and the death scene that you like uh, and I like so much with Lady Bullseye, how she had to follow Akiko, even though she didn't want to. And so Akiko decides to jump in the salt water because salt hurts ghosts and since we saw that with bryce so much in the first season i think it was nice freeing him from that um and and also it kind of gave him the pinocchio moment you right. know 
where he's a real he's a real person again speaking of harley quinn mind mall episode eight is another episode and i feel like it happens in every tv show where the characters are stuck in someone's mind and they have to try and find a way to make it out or risk being like stuck there Tron forever themed, it was like a tron themed mind too it didn't go as expansive as as something like harley quinn but mm-hmm. yeah it was just kind of the same type of storyline i have so many comparisons when it comes to this i've already talked about the heaven and hell and devils and stuff like that but you can also compare this to um, Peacemaker in that you have like a group of unorthodox good guys. Yeah. At first, I thought it was the co-op. We should get to it. The fact that the co-op eventually shows its true colors. Haruka is actually the person who realizes that uh, Double Tap was the one who killed mostly her entire police force um, in Japan. And that's why they moved to that's why she moved to New York to follow Bryce and the monkey yeah. to uh, to see if she could get um, some form of um I, I it's not vengeance for her it was more just like trying to get to like some sort of solace and it's a thing. it's a question because they show the death scene of all her like uh companions or all the police uh, people, people from the first season too yeah in season in, in episode one of this and so you're kind of left wondering who's it going to be and yeah then she figures it out it's also got some of the less realistic less realistic aspects that like ash versus the evil dead had where it he he had the plot armor, but at the same time, you could still feel for the characters, despite the fact that they were constantly dying and coming back to life right. and fighting these insane creatures and stuff. So so that's the type of anarchy that you're kind of walking into this show. And I can understand why some people wouldn't like that. I had, your- I had John Wick, Dog Wick primal just because especially of episode six when big hit monkey turns into like a bigger version of himself that seemed like straight out of primal and then also echo with the daughter and dad storyline kind of like king ping and echo and then in here all obviously bryce and uh and iris Hmm. by episode seven it sort of becomes clear right episode seven eight that who the like that the co-op is evil and that is where they team up with dot the only one of the co-op who is actually good and they try to defeat but boone is already in the center of town uh, of new york and new york isn't greatly represented like there's a lot of shows based out of new york that which make new york almost like a character new york had no characterization yeah it could have been any town yeah so yeah he just the only starts... the only thing is Times square they do animate Times square but even but that they, is very yeah, it's but very it minimal like the vibe of it wasn't different than in the first season um and so yeah he takes over Times square and he starts expanding outward with his giant branches of arms and and uh they're eating all the humans around turning them into it's like annihilation he had thanos he had thanos's i guess uh envisionment where he was going to bring back life and all the animals were going to be good kind of eliminate he was going to do the noah's ark thing you know just call it a wash right um and and see how it worked and hit monkey gets out there and he's sad and everybody's trying to fight their way towards him with a big bomb to kill him and then uh at the end there uh you get the kind of cool climactic scene where he's going to all these different places trying to convince hit monkey that um what that he should just give up on humanity And we get an even backflash further than we gotten in the first season from the hit monkey that showed that he uh, he was originally being tested or his parents, his real parents. He was being being tested. tested. A doctor felt bad about it, decided to steal and could only take a hit monkey who was a baby at this time, then got in a car crash. And uh, and then the the car crash ended into a forest. And that's where hit monkey just kind of ran away. And we can only assume ran into the other monkeys that he was with in episode one. And this is where. Yeah. Well, no, we saw them run into the actual, those actual monkeys. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, this is where it plays a little fast and loose because originally, when he's when the boon is bringing them to these places, it's in real time. So, like, they have to fight in real time in ancient Japan or wherever they're they're being shot arrows at. And in the last scene, the one with him becoming uh, leaving the testing facility, they jump to the car scene like he's doing like flips through the t- through time, and it made no sense. But again, you just got to give the show that. You also have to understand, like, there are huge plot holes with, like, Eunice. Yeah. (laughs) At the beginning, she says, when Hitmonkey walks in to the door and says uh, that he wants to now join New York's agency, um, that that they're a big family there. And she shows all the footage of, or sorry, all the pictures on the wall, kind of like a dentist's office. And she's, she's like, we're all so close, except for Bryce. Bryce was just a dick. He's awful. But if there's anything we learned throughout the season, it's A, no, they're not. None of them are like a family, really. And B, 
Bryce is just like everyone else there. Like there, w- I don't know why she would have separated it that way in her head. When they take, when they take, when they take all the family as units refers to them as in episode nine. I agree. It's like you never really get the sense of camaraderie there, and the, even uh, people like Steve or the Cleaver, or, Steve or the Cleaver was great, or Guillotine or, or someone like that. Yeah, they all just kind of act and even sound like Bryce. So there really isn't that much uh, difference. I just meant the fact that none of them showed up for her, which she made a big deal about later on. Like you guys didn't but like it never seemed like they were giving the uh they they weren't faking it to her they weren't pretending they would show up at different points the um the yellow eyes of double tap this is a real nitpick but like for her her hakura whatever uh to realize in that second what had happened and put it all together and be 100 percent right about it i was completely expecting the co-op to still be good but like for her to have misunderstood but the fact that she jumps to that conclusion and then they immediately steal the sword and then the the co-ops thing has been up until then to act like they're normal and but their immediate thing is let's go kill them you know yeah. let's send hit monkey to kill them it, it's such rash decisions so quickly it felt kind of out of place in the season but overall are there any other faults that you want us in throw towards the show just i the i didn't think that the story was ever going to be like give me many surprises and aside from maybe killing off a couple characters because that's what happens akiko ended up dying i didn't actually expect that but aside from that and hakura's death uh really the show was not that surprising but i think the animation is so good it doesn't really matter and i also really like the ending to each uh to each episode after the hit monkey kind of the after credit sequences i thought they did add a lot to it especially in the finale so i'm going to be giving it kind of a high score but an eight out of ten i'm yeah i'll also give it an eight out of ten for a while after episode three i was thinking maybe i would go all the way to like an 8.5 and 9 um and then it did kind of fall apart with the co-op i think um but you add the humor the random spectacular animation uh the shameless we're gonna fight every bad guy now like i mentioned and uh, the show is very very entertaining and it's easy to move past those motivation plot holes you know yeah and also it seems like bryce kind of repeated his same arc from the first season where he had to learn to be like selfless yeah he yeah. started off season two he was back to being the same guy and but uh, again with 10 episodes and all of them being 20 minutes i feel like it's the perfect amount of time for something like this it's just so busy but without the busyness it wouldn't be as good a show i so, agree thanks for listening we'll see you in the next episode hope you enjoyed this one bye bye